Right now, investors and markets are both banking on a Fed pivot coming sooner than expected. This is because of major indications of economic weakness around the world, including major banks like Credit Suisse being in major trouble. Because of this, markets have been pricing in a higher likelihood of a Fed pivot coming sooner, including stock markets starting to rebound heavily and yields being down. But I'm gonna point out how the market anticipating and trying to front run this Fed pivot actually makes the Fed's job of tightening easier and means they can go longer without a pivot. Ready? Let's dive in. Real quick word from today's sponsor, I Trust Capital. You guys know that I have used and recommended I Trust Capital for a very long time because you can invest in crypto using your IRA and you can invest in gold and silver using your IRA. This means that whether you want to start up a new IRA and make new contributions to a traditional or a Roth, or whether you have money already in a retirement account that you wanna roll over and use to buy gold, silver, or cryptocurrencies, you can do that safely, cheaply, and easily with iTrust Capital. And I'm serious when I say safely because they take security extremely seriously. They never take custody of your assets, they never borrow or lend, against your assets, they never let their custody providers do either of those either. They also have an extremely straightforward pricing model. They do not have any monthly account fee. It's 1% for crypto, 50 bucks for gold, and 250 for silver. Given the fact that cryptocurrency is in a severe bear market right now, many people are looking for ways to start buying the dip and getting in at the bottom here, but also people should be concerned about any tax implications that might come along with cryptocurrency gains later on should those assets be worth a lot more. Doing this within an IRA is the perfect way to shield yourself from those tax liabilities. If you do it with a Roth, any contributions that are made are taxed, which means any gains are not. In a traditional IRA, it is the exact opposite. And so IRAs are a fantastic strategy to avoid some of the tax implications you would have in a regular brokerage or regular crypto account. And because they have assets like physical gold and physical silver available as well. This gives many people the option to invest in these alternative forms of money that normally you would not be able to do in a regular IRA or your 401k at work. So I'm a huge fan of iTrust Capital using it for crypto, gold, or silver with your retirement money. And if you use my link in the description below, I've got a little bonus waiting for you as well. Recently, bonds and stocks around the world have been rallying because of anticipating a soon Sooner Fed pivot. Part of this has to do with the recent collapse in the UK, the major trouble that a Swiss bank, Credit Suisse, has been in, and people looking around the world and thinking, hey, central banks are going to have to start bailing out banks. They're already starting up QE, like in the case of the Bank of England again. And so it's only a matter of time before the Fed pivots, especially as the UN itself is calling on the Fed and other central banks to pivot. Pair all that with signs of weakness in the US economy and markets are starting to price in a greater chance of a Fed pivot. But in order to understand why the market pricing this in means an actual longer time frame before the Fed pivots, we have to really grasp the impact of the cost of money on economic performance. So let's take a step back here and talk about money mechanics here. If we have a cost of grain and we have a cost of soybeans and we have a cost of fuel, we have a cost of pizza, a cost of everything, we usually are looking at as just how many dollars or your local currency does it take to get that item. And that's the cost of something. So when we talk about money, it can be a little bit difficult to grasp that money has a cost as well well, and all we have to do is answer the exact same question. How much does it take to acquire money? And so when we frame it that way, we realize that interest rates on debt are the cost of money. So if interest rates are 5%, 10%, or 20%, those all represent the cost of acquiring money, and it's usually for a specific action. So if you want to be able to acquire new money to go buy a Gucci bag, you're probably gonna have to do that on your credit card, and that's probably gonna run you 20, 25%. So the cost of that money is pretty expensive. Now, instead, if you want to acquire money to go buy a house, and then that debt is collateralized by the actual price, 
property, then the cost of that money is a lot cheaper, 6%, 7% right now. So there's a cost to getting money and that is the interest rate on debt. Now imagine for me that we live in a sound hard money world. Let's just talk about gold coins. Every single person on earth has gold coins for money. There's no paper, there's no digital transactions. We're going back 3000 years for this. If I wanna borrow money from somebody, that money actually has to get transferred. So if I borrow money from you, that means I can go spend your money, but it means that you can't spend that money anymore. So when debt takes place, there's no inflation or deflation because it's the same amount of money trading in an economy. Very different from today where money is lent into existence and when debt is created, those are new dollars being spent. They weren't transferred from somebody else's bank account. So how does the cost of money work in a hard money system like this? Well, we have to go back to the fundamental drivers of cost of price that influence literally everything, supply and demand. If there's, let's say we make 10 times the amount of pizza this year that we did last year, the cost of pizza will probably be pretty low. There would be some warehouses full of pizza, people would be able to buy it up. Heck, even something like properties, like real estate, if we just decided for whatever reason that we were gonna make 100 times the amount of homes that we have today, they're all gonna be built next year, well then the abundance of homes is gonna be huge, and so somebody who has three or four or five homes might not want them or need them as much as what they might sell them for, and so the price would be driven down because they'd be so abundant, they would be much more abundant than everything else, so the price would go down, again, all else being equal. So supply and demand are the fundamental drivers of price always and everywhere and always have been and always will be. So how does supply and demand influence the cost of money? Well, go back to where gold coins were money and we realize that if we look at an economy and we say, okay, nobody has any savings. Everybody has like, you know, enough for like just to make it to the next day and I wanna go into this economy and I wanna borrow from somebody, it's gonna be pretty difficult. The demand for money is super high because nobody has any money and the supply of money is really low. So if there is one person that has one extra gold coin, they can demand any interest rate they want because all of the borrowers are competing for their business, they could demand 10, 20, 30%, and there's a good chance somebody might be willing to pay that. Now, contrast this with the other side when the supply and demand dynamics are flipped, and you get an economy where everybody has tons in savings. They have you know hundreds of gold coins in storage. Well, now nobody has a need to borrow because everybody has a ton of savings, and so if somebody wants to lend, they're gonna have to lend at a really low interest rate because all the lenders now are competing for borrowers. So what we see here now is how the cost of money communicates information about how abundant or scarce money is. That's all prices do, and that's why interest rates are the cost of money, because they communicate to an economy how abundant or scarce money is. So it's very, very easy to do business in an economy like this because when interest rates are super high, it means money is scarce and it means that if you can find a way to get some money and to save, then you can make some money. The incentive is to save so that you can be a lender. On the other side, you're not gonna be wanting to borrow because you know it's gonna be extremely costly to do that. And so you are going to just spend what you have. You're gonna be very conservative. You're gonna try and save. You're not gonna spend money on risky things because you're in the mode of saving and building up that savings pool. So the high cost means low supply, high demand. That contributes to increasing production of that good, in this case, money. On the other side of the coin, if money is extremely abundant, interest rates are low, that means that everybody wants to lend everybody can borrow and spend it on risk. They can spend it on anything because at the end of the day, there's a lot of money and so people can afford to borrow more. Okay, I think I've driven that home enough now so we can bring this back to why we can't anticipate a Fed pivot anytime soon, specifically because the market is starting to price this in. Let's go back to treasuries. If we look at the two-year treasury, we see yields have been falling since the 26th of September. Same thing for the 10-year, same thing for the 20-year and the 30-year. Over the last few days, around the same time, the stock market has been rallying both the the small caps, the Dow, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500. Heck, even things like silver are up 17% within the last few days. Gold is up about 7% within the last few days. And so the world is saying, hey, there's a lot of hard things coming up. And so there's a greater chance that the Federal Reserve might make money 
cheaper. And so we can front run that and start to buy things because when money gets cheaper, prices go up. Because remember, if money is cheaper, that means money is abundant. That means people can go spend money on more stuff, including assets. The market has gotten very good at front running the Fed over the last couple of decades. And for good reason, because every time we've had economic trouble, the Fed has pivoted. What is different this time? Is there anything different this time? Yes, the CPI. The CPI hasn't been as high as it is in 40 years. We have to go back all the way to the 80s before the CPI was as high as it is today. So we can't compare it to the 2000s, to the 09, 010. We can't compare it to the 2018, 2019 pivot, to what happened in 2020, because the CPI is all the way up here and it hasn't been that high since the Fed was in major tightening mode last time. Let's look at a little bit more recent history. In 2020, the Federal Reserve said they were gonna make money extremely cheap, extremely easy, and extremely abundant. Did they do that? Yes, they absolutely did that. Over the next year and a half, they continually said, we are not even thinking about thinking about raising rates or getting tighter. And then they suddenly started to give indication that they were starting to think about it. And then they gave a plan on when they were gonna start. And guess what? They started when they said they were gonna start at the beginning of 2022. Since that time, the only indication that they have given is that they're going to get tighter and tighter and tighter until one of two things happens. Inflation comes down significantly or the jobs market utterly collapses. Have we seen either one of those things happen yet? No. Let's go back to the cost of money here. When the market anticipates the Fed easing, that means the market eases by itself. Interest rates have fallen over the last couple of weeks. This means money has gotten cheaper over the last couple of weeks. That's why prices have gone up over the last few weeks. Will this contribute to a collapse in the jobs market? No. Will this contribute to a collapse in inflation? No. So with the market responding by getting easy in anticipation of the Fed getting easy, it's actually making conditions easier, which means it's not going to hamper jobs or inflation. And the Federal Reserve has been very clear that they have to see one of those two things happen before they get easier again. Further than that, the market's actually offsetting the attempts by the Fed to become tight. If the Federal Reserve is raising rates and selling assets, while at the same time the market is saying, we're gonna start buying those up because we think the Fed's gonna turn around and do the opposite, that makes the Fed's job of at least looking like it's trying to tighten much easier. Now, plenty of you have been pointing out to me on Twitter that it looks like the reverse repo market might be responsible for some of this easing over the last couple of days, as we've seen a potentially a significant drop over the last few days. I don't think it is what is being talked about at least yet, but we've run out of time for this video. So that's gonna be my next video. I'll put that up tomorrow. As always, really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.